Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Scott Ernest, Associate Director for Construction in NIOSH's Office of Construction Safety and Health. I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar on NIOSH activities supporting the optimization of respiratory protection. This is the 15th webinar so far in the CPWR NIOSH bi-monthly COVID-19 webinar series for the construction industry. And we're fortunate to have timely research updates on topics we touched on earlier in the series, but continue to get frequent questions as knowledge evolves about respirators and face coverings. Respirators and face coverings can help protect workers and prevent the spread of COVID-19. Understanding the differences between the types of respirators and face coverings, how to wear them and when, and their effectiveness is critical. Today, we're gonna to hear from Dr. Marianne D'Alessandro, the director of the NIOSH Personal Protective Technology Laboratory at NIOSH about the latest research findings from the lab related to respirators and face masks, what it means, and how to use the information. After the presentation, we'll take some time for questions and answers. Chris Kane, executive director at CPWR, is here to moderate, and she'll lead us through some questions we received during the registration, as well as some live questions as time permits. With that, I'll hand it over to Dr. D'Alessandro. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Scott. Nice to be here today. Thank you, everyone, for having me. Let's see if I can, there we go. So today I'll talk about, um, first I'll start with the Federal Respirator and Mask Authorities, just so everyone is aware, in case you are not, um, who the authorities are for respirators and masks. And then just give updates on where we are throughout the response on respirator research and activities underway in the approval program, and then talk a little bit about masks as well. So first of all, for those of you who are not aware, um, I am with NPPTL, as Scott said, and NPPTL's mission revolves around personal protective equipment, including PPE research, standards development, certification, with an emphasis on respirator certification and approval, and post-market activities and translational science as well, including workplace interventions. And when it comes to respirator authorities, there are authorities uh, with three federal agencies, NIOSH, OSHA, and FDA, all have regulatory authorities. And first of all, when it comes to overseeing respirator use in the workplace, over uh, OSHA oversees that respirator workplace compliance, and NIOSH is responsible for approving, both from, both from a pre-market standpoint and from a post-approval standpoint, all of the respirators you see on the left-hand side of the slide. And then FDA also has authorities when it comes to those surgical N95 respirators that are, you see on the right-hand side here. And I'll go into a little bit what the authority is for FDA. So FDA has requirements, additional requirements for surgical N95s on top of the filtration efficiency performance and the breathing resistance that NIOSH has. And those, those tests that they require include fluid penetration, flammability, and biocompatibility. Since 2017, NIOSH has had, uh, has taken, I don't want to say taken over that responsibility from FDA, but FDA has relinquished that authority to NIOSH. So NIOSH now approves respirators for use in the healthcare setting as well. However, when there is a device that is different or substantially different from any device that is already on the market in healthcare, such as a device that would have some type of external coding on it that would require an additional evaluation, then FDA um, becomes involved in that process again. But at this time, all of these uh, approvals are going just through NIOSH. And then also, it's important to know the difference between source control and respiratory protection during COVID. Um, this is the first time that we've played a role in looking at source control as well. And, and source control, of course, is when it is you are wearing a device to protect others, not yourself. And then respiratory protection protects the wearer. Now, um, and I'll get into this a little bit later, um, we have, there is some evidence that the devices that are being worn for source control also are providing some protection, though not the same as respiratory protection, but some protection for the wearer as well. 
So throughout the COVID response, we have seen an increased use in all of the respirators uh, across the board in healthcare and a, a desire to use these across any other industry sectors as such as construction. And mostly we have been dealing with a numerous influx of applications of filtering face piece respirators from international and na national manufacturers. Um, and then also there is a lot of um, elastomeric use starting to take place in the emergency response area as well as in healthcare and a desire to have these respirators that do not have exhalation valves. And I'll talk a little bit about that later as well. And then we've seen a, an increase in the use of powered air purifying respirators as well in a, an influx of the number of applications received for packers also. And it's important to know that there are three factors required uh, for wearing a, for a respirator to be effective. Um, it has to be put on correctly, and it also has to be worn properly, and then it also has to have effective filtration efficiency. And I'll talk about each of those areas a little bit. So in order to be worn properly, um, you have to comply with an OSHA respiratory protection program, and that includes medical evaluation, formal training, and fit testing. And throughout the COVID response, OSHA has exercised some enforcement authority um, or in, in allowing manufacturer, or not manufacturers, allowing users to be able to uh, not comply with all of the requirements of an OSHA respiratory protection program if they are able to demonstrate that they had made every effort possible to try to have all of those components of their respiratory protection program in place. Um, OSHA encourages and users to make in workplaces to make sure they do have medical evaluation for users because there are some with underlying health conditions who may not be able to wear a respirator. Also, they have uh, relaxed the enforcement authority relative to fit testing. And at this time, they're requiring initial fit testing for respiratory protection, but the annual fit testing, again, if you can demonstrate that you're having difficulty, that you have tried to conduct fit testing but are having difficulty in doing so, then they are relaxing that enforcement authority for the annual fit testing. And respirators used by the general public are not subject to the same regulations required in the workplace. And in fact, there are no regulations at this time for respirator use by the general public, and there are activities underway to um, explore this issue a little bit more. It's also very important to make sure the respirator is fit tested to ensure it has proper protection. And construction workers do know this um, because you have many exposures where you have to are required to wear respirators in your workplace. And the largest factor associated with fit testing is the seal leaking around the edges of the respirator. And that is why it is very important. Um, something that we have found out um, in recent years is that conducting that user seal check at the beginning of the, when you first put the respirator on after every donning um, provides a much, uh, not a guarantee fit, but it also um, allows the user to have greater assurance that that respirator is going to continue to provide the protection that it is supposed to provide them. And it's important also to note that it's not a substitution for a fit test. Um, but there is some research underway that has been looking at um, the ability of somebody to rapidly um, conduct that user seal check and then have that have the, the fit um, continue to be uh, retained um, without having the, the um, typical training that someone would undergo. So there's more research underway in that area right now. And we all know that uh, facial hair is something that should not be um, compromised, the respirator seal. And we have some infographics that show what types of facial hair can be appropriate when wearing a respirator. And those are the types of facial hair that have the green checks in this infographic that is on our website and has gotten a lot of visibility. 
And when it comes to respiratory protection, there is often confusion regarding what types of particles are captured by the respirators that are used in the workplace. And when we evaluate our respirators for the approval program, we use a 0.3 micron mass median aerodynamic diameter particle, which is the most penetrating particle. And since it is the most penetrating particle, which is at that particle size range that you see with the green dashes, every other particle size will be captured by that respirator. Um, there are some who believe that you have to evaluate with every size particle in order to make sure that respirator is going to protect the wearer. However, that is not the case. There is a lot of research out there that shows that by through evaluation with the most penetrating particle that uh, you will have that guarantee for protection at our, all other particle sizes. I'm sorry, my cat is in the background joining our conversation. Um, also, um, respirate when it comes to filtration efficiency, the respirators that are on the market and the various um, unregulated devices and FDA surgical masks all have variable filtration efficiency. Uh, you can see on this slide, this was um, from a publication uh, back over 10 years ago. However, we recently conducted additional studies that aligned with these results. And the results are that when it comes to a NIOSH N95 respirator, the filtration efficiency has to be at least 95%. However, most of those respirators achieve a higher level of filtration efficiency, greater than 95. And the ones that we evaluated were over 98. Um, where you have the 95 is, is because of the seal potential seal leakage that is allowed. And when you're looking at unregulated dust masks and improvised devices and cloth masks, those are quite variable. And you have to be really careful when you're looking at purchasing those devices because you can't tell just by looking at them how protective they are going to be. And that is why now there are some other regulations underway or under development and standards under development to um, make sure that the those unregulated devices are evaluated by third-party labs and have that a designation and, and identifier on them saying what level of protection is being provided. And that is all underway right now with an ASTM test method for cloth masks. So um, throughout the response, in addition to the NIOSH-approved respirators, because of the shortages that we're, we were having, um, we authorized respirators from other countries to be used as well. And the countries you can see on the right-hand side are um, Australia, Brazil, People's Republic of China, Europe, Japan, Korea, and Mexico. And all of those countries have standards uh, respirator standards, as you see on the right-hand uh, side of that chart. And the reason we chose these countries and stand associated standards is because we have been involved with all of these countries in working on the ISO standards, and we know that these standards align with the NIOSH N95 standard um, for half masks and um, allow for an APF of, or provide for an APF of 10. So we allowed for that, but then throughout the response, what was happening is we were getting um, word from a lot of users that um, these devices didn't seem to have the integrity that they thought they should have and perform as expected. So we started a, an evaluation process to evaluate respirators that were coming from these other countries to uh, to quantify their performance and found that over 60% of the international respirators that were coming into the country were not providing that expected level of filtration efficiency. So we worked with, we've been working with a lot of government agencies, including the FDA. And the FDA, um, so if any of you are planning to purchase or any of these respirators from other countries, I would highly suggest, even though you're not in the healthcare industry, I would highly suggest that you look at the FDA's 
emergency use authorization list of respirators because those are the respirators that we have evaluated and we have confidence that they are meeting the requirements that we expect them to meet. Anything else that you would be buying off of um, Amazon, eBay, uh, wherever, if it's um, just going on the web to buy these products. And I think um, there was a, a New York Times article actually um, that talked about New York's purchases it was in the paper yesterday and and um, and and talked about how the New York is suing um, those who where they purchase the respirators from and this has been just a horrible horrible issue for our country um, with all of the the counterfeit and substandard products that are out there so again if you're going to purchase any of these from these other countries I would make sure they're on this FDA list because that is a list of the products that both um, NIOSH and FDA have um, have validated will continue to meet the requirements and we have a, I have the URL here where the results of all of our testing is. So even if you have a product that isn't on the list, if you have a product that is in one of our reports, and now I have 380 reports here, but we have about 500 reports that are posted now. Um, if you have a product that was there, I would not, I'd be very cautious in purchasing it um, if it has achieved filtration efficiency less than expected. Another issue that uh, we have been dealing with throughout the response is the exhalation valve issue. And that is both from a filtering face piece respirator standpoint and from an elastomeric half mask respirator standpoint as well. And the current CDC guidance is that, and this is posted on the web right now, is if you are using a respirator, actually that you should not use a respirator that has an exhalation valve. However, last week, um, NIOSH published a report. Um, it's the technical report on filtering face piece respirators, and it's that um, report that has the yellow background in the bottom right-hand side there, and I have the URL at the bottom of the page. And that technical report was, was um, initiated because there are many, we know there are many FFRs out there with exhalation valves and our suspicion or our intuition was that they would provide source control that would be relatively equivalent to those cloth masks or cloth face coverings or surgical masks because you do not have the gaps on the side that you would have and that that exhalation valve opening is not just an open hole it has a a a rubber valve that opens um, during breathing, and it acts as a diverter. It's not just, again, it's just not an open port. So our suspicion was that they would provide similar source control as the cloth masks would be. And uh, sure enough, that is what we found, and that is all in the technical report. So I did not um, say anything about updated guidance here right now because we are working with CDC to update the guidance. And there are three things that we are going to say. One is that you know, if you're using a cloth mask uh, for source control, that a respirator with an exhalation valve would provide, would expect to provide similar uh, source control to that that mask. And uh, the second um, thing that we are saying is that um, there are some manufacturers who are looking to provide an accessory to cover the exhalation valve. So if um, you use that manufacturer designated accessory, then you would not um, compromise the NIOSH approval because typically if you put anything over the exhalation valve or make any modification to the respirator, that voids the NIOSH approval. Um, so you would want to use anything that is provided by the manufacturer. So um, we're hoping that within uh, several weeks that um, at least one manufacturer will have an accessory uh, provided and recommended and it's something off the shelf that can be used. I think it's some um, specific type of duct tape or an EKG pad uh, or some other medical type of tape that could be used to cover that exhalation valve and um, it does not impact uh, the breathing resistance on that device either. However, it may not provide the comfort that you did when you had the exhalation valve that isn't covered. So we're hoping that the CDC guidance will be updated within the next several weeks. 
And the next area we, where we have some research ongoing is with Elastomeric half mask respirators. And um, right now you may have heard that we recently approved the first respirator without an exhalation valve that is an elastomeric half mask respirator. So that was the first one approved. So that is good news that that is now on the market. And then we have had four other manufacturers who have expressed interest in also providing the same type of thing, a, an elastomeric respirator without an exhalation valve. Um, so, or, or rather than not having an exhalation valve, having a, some type of filter that covers that exhalation valve. So we're looking forward to having um, those devices on the market as soon as they are available. Again, this is something you know we didn't have to worry about before, but it's something that may be a, a concern um, into the future. And um, so right now, when it comes to the elastomeric uh, guidance that is out there in crisis capacity, and this is um, what we have provided in healthcare, um, when it comes to routine operations, uh, disinfection from um, viruses um, or in a healthcare setting is not part of the NIOSH approval. Uh, we point to the, the manufacturer's instructions. However, OSHA does permit employers to clean uh, these devices. And in the healthcare setting, there is, a, it's called the Bessesen Protocol. It's a, a research study that was conducted by a researcher, Bessesen, and has been used in several healthcare facilities successfully to disinfect the elastomeric component of the elastomeric devices. In routine operations, um, when it comes to the filter cartridges, um, they are not recommended um, in many cases, some manufacturers do not recommend cleaning them, and then in a healthcare setting, they do not use the ones at the bottom, that what is called the pancake filters. When it comes to the crisis capacity guidance, um, we do recommend that, that best is in protocol, and then we also recommend that those enclosed cartridges can be wiped down, and we provide some guidance on how they can be wiped down and some EPA authorized disinfectants that can be used to do so without compromising the filter media. So if the filter media is compromised or it does get um, wet or um, impacted in any way, then you would not want to continue using them. But some healthcare facilities have indicated that they've used these um, cartridges in a healthcare setting from five to ten years, but conservatively, we are saying that you can use them for about one year. And um, we're continuing to, we have a, a few projects underway to look at um, the elastomerics. Another project for those elastomerics that are out on the market that do have the exhalation valve we are look the current CDC recommendation is to cover that valve with a surgical mask. That is not a science-based recommendation. It was a recommendation um, to provide a crisis strategy to be able to use these devices. And uh, what we are doing now is evaluating the most commonly used elastomerics and um, developing devices to close off the exhalation valve or filter it and see if it continues to meet the NIOSH requirements um, for breathing resistance um, so we don't have any CO2 buildup and the worker continues to get the protection and continues to be safe. So as I mentioned a little earlier, we also have several activities underway to look at respiratory protection and source control for the general public. Um, one is a National Academies effort underway that is a consensus study to look at what respiratory protection should be considered and what regulatory aspects should be considered for the general public into the future. And another effort is working on an ASTM barrier face covering standard that is going to be recommending uh, the use of the NIOSH test method for respirators to evaluate face, face coverings at two different levels. Uh, one level is at least at a level of 20% efficiency, 
and the next level is um, greater than 50% level of efficiency. So um, the hope is that by having that standard, you'll be able to have a better understanding of what level of protection a device you might be wearing uh, for source control, so a mask that you might be wearing, what level of protection or what level of filtration efficiency fit and um, breathing resistance, um, what level they have. So next I'll just talk a little bit about masks and the CDC guidance that's out there. So currently the CDC guidance does recommend a suite of measures that be used um, in order to provide protection for the general public um, from COVID-19. And of course the first um, is to social distance, providing um, at least six feet of distance between anyone you would be in close contact with. Second is wearing that um, cloth mask or a mask and often washing your hands with soap and water with at least 60% alcohol base and if soap and water is not available and then frequently disinfecting um, the surfaces that are nearby. And when it comes to wearing these masks, CDC does recommend that they are worn um, around when you are around individuals who are not in your household, and especially when you are not able to maintain the, the social distancing uh, that is recommended. And the recommendations do indicate that these masks will help protect both the the um, the wearer and help to protect those who may be exposed to you if you happen to be exposed to COVID. So uh, because, of course, that we know that the virus can still be spread even if people don't have symptoms, they can be asymptomatic, and that's a, a big part of the concern right now because in many areas they're considering that everyone is possibly asymptomatic, so everyone should be wearing a mask when you're around others not in your close, um, in your household and that by wearing these masks, they're most likely to help the spread when they're used in these public settings by everyone. And uh, there is evidence that the masks do prevent the respiratory, the large respiratory droplets from traveling into the air and to the other people. So these masks, um, as, as I showed you earlier on the slide where I talked about the filtration efficiency, Filtration efficiency is quite variable, um, and that is at the that's evaluated at that that most penetrating particle. So at that most penetrating particle, the filtration efficiency you're getting ranges, you know, in that 10 to 20 percent for most of these cloth masks. But when it comes to those larger respiratory droplets, there is evidence that it is those those products are capturing all of those larger respiratory droplets. So we do not. The challenge we have right now is we do not know the level of protection. We do not know how many of these products are being captured by these these devices. But what we do know from a lot of the studies that are out there right now is that there is evidence that when um, every people are wearing, everyone is wearing them when in close contact with others, then you have a, a reduced um, level of transmission. And um, let's see. And then, of course, when in the indoor settings or when it's most important to have on these devices. But even uh, there has been evidence of transmission in outdoor settings, too, and when there have been gatherings of a larger number of people in a small, smaller outdoor setting space, there has been uh, transmission identified, too. So if, even if you're in an outdoor setting around others, you should be wearing the, the device as well. And then most importantly is how do we select these masks? And um, there are many factors that come into play when you're deciding on what type of mask to be to wear. And first of all, it should have at least two layers, but you don't want to have probably 10 layers because then it's going to be very difficult to breathe through and you're going to have effects of dizziness and things like that. So you want to have a reasonable number of layers, but more layers would provide more um, filtration. And then you also want to make sure you cover your mouth and your nose. Um, you see a lot of people out there who are 
um, have their nose exposed, and the nose is the entry portal for many um, viruses that can um, move into the lungs, so it's very important to um, to wear, cover your nose as well because those smaller particles can get into your nose. And then um, they have to make sure they fit snugly also. Um, as we know, with surgical masks, you have the gaps on the sides and around the top and the bottom, and a lot of most of these masks also have a lot of those gaps, which is where you have the particle entry and exit as well. And then also when selecting the masks, um, there have been a few studies out there on gaiters, and uh, those studies have shown that gaiters are not a good product to wear. However, there are other studies that show if you have at least two or more layers and you fold that, that gaiter, that that could provide a similar level of, of protection and source control as a cloth mask um, that is not a gaiter would provide. When it comes to face shields, face shields are not recommended in the same light as um, cloth masks because of the gaps that you have um, around the sides and they're not, you are not covering your mouth and nose. The particles can come underneath that face shield as well. So um, some people are wearing a mask and then putting a face shield on top of it, which is a, a better option. And then and there are some situations, um, glasses, uh, you want to make sure that uh, the mask sits closely over the nose and mouth and doesn't in interfere with the glasses. And oftentimes wearing the glasses over the mask helps uh, because there is a lot of fogging that happens with these, these masks that don't have a tight seal. And masks should not be worn by children younger than two years old and uh, by those who have trouble breathing. A lot of those people who have trouble breathing are wearing face shields, so it is, um, while it's not recommended in general to just have a face shield on, if you don't have a choice, then a face shield would be an option. And anybody who is unconscious, incapacitated, or otherwise not able to remove the mask should not be wearing the mask, some of those with some disabilities. And that is all I had for today. So thank you for having me. I hope um, you found some of this information useful, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Dr. DeLisandro. Um, I was really looking forward to this. This is Chris Kane, and I'm going to ask you some questions that both came in during the registration process and also came in um, live today. The one that you've already answered is on gators. Um, so I won't ask that one, but the, the information that you shared was very interesting. Um, here's a question. Hmm. You did talk about the recent research that you did on filtering face piece respirators with exhalation valves, which I find very exciting because they are from, if I can paraphrase what you said, um, they seem to be at least as good at source control as do cloth masks. Um, right. So that's very, very exciting because we do have um, a good supply of N95s or better with exhalation valves, filtering face piece. But the specific question that was asked by the participant was, um, are, is there any research underway to evaluate the exhalation valves that are in elastomeric face piece respirators as source control? Yes, we do have um, that work underway as well. And the prelim I could tell you that the preliminary findings, um, we are finding the same thing, but um, we don't have any published data on that yet. Um, there are a, um, a few of the respirators where you have a um, greater level of particle penetration. Um, so all of that we'll be following, though. I, I think that that would be available by the spring because we want to do some human subject studies on that, which we have not uh, completed yet. We've been having a hard time um, getting human subjects in during the COVID response. And then, so, so yes, so we're looking at that for the last Americans, and then also the work that I mentioned where we're looking at actually filtering 
um, identifying filters to put in those most commonly used elastomerics that that um, we have. What we've done is we've um, identified uh, some 3M products, Honeywell, North, and um, MSA products, and I think a Moldex product that we are looking to um, evaluate some type of filter to put over that exhalation valve. Um, actually, not over, but under that exhalation valve to be able to filter anything that might be coming out. So all that is to come. Unfortunately, it's still in process right now. Great. Um, so there's a, a series of questions related to OSHA requirements um, and respirator programs, things like fit testing and medical clearance. So I, I, I'm going to throw a couple of these out at you. Um, one of them said smaller employers um, more often than not are overwhelmed by the medical evaluation requirements in OSHA's respiratory protection standard. Um, is there any way to include some kind of guidance or um, decision flow chart for this requirement? Well, um, this would be fall under OSHA's purview, but I can say that um, OSHA has a lot of enforcement guidance up on their website, and the expectation by them um, is that you know workplaces um, should take every measure to have aspects of the respiratory protection program in place, but they are uh, taking enforcement discretion if workplaces can demonstrate or document that it's infeasible to complete any parts of the process. So I don't think that they have a flow chart that would say, okay, if, if you can't do this, then don't do this, because they, they want you to try to um, address every aspect, um, every possible aspect if you can, and then document why you couldn't. Did that help? That question? I think it does because um, okay. there are several questions related to kind of OSHA's take on it, and um, I think the best the best guidance is what you said to to really take a look at OSHA's website and see what they're saying, people um, of how they're relaxing their enforcement and how they're not. Um, one question that was asked is addressing the new ASTM F thirty four oh seven respirator fit test standards. Um, I'm not familiar with that, but if, if, if you are, if there's anything that you wanted to say about that? Sure, I could say something about that. So that is called the respirator fit capability standard. And what that standard is, for those who aren't familiar, is it is a standard that um, that manufacturers can use to evaluate their product and to market their product to say that you know, we have evaluated this product by evaluating so many human subjects. I believe it's a panel, panel of um, 25, I believe. So there's a panel of 25, and then there is a respirator fit capability um, level that the manufacturer would identify by using that panel of human subjects. Then they would identify um, what, how many of those human subjects achieved a fit in the, the panel. So it's using the NIOSH anthropometric panel of face sizes that is small, medium, and large face sizes. And the manufacturer would have to identify members in that panel of all sizes. And if they have one respirator that is, say, a one size fits all, then they would evaluate all sizes within the panel using that one size fits all. If they have what we're calling a family of respirators, then they would use that panel of 25 and say they have a small, medium, and large. If one member in that panel would try on that respirator and not be able to fit a medium, then they would try on a small. If they didn't fit a small, then they fit a large. If they didn't fit any, then that person wouldn't fit. But this gives the manufacturer an opportunity to say, what percent of that panel would be fit by this particular respirator type? And then, um, you know, it's a way to market their device. So at this point in time, you know, NIOSH, when we approve filtering face piece respirators, 
we do not um, conduct any fit testing on those devices. So fit testing uh, for those devices is something that happens in the workplace, but for other respirators, we do conduct fit testing prior to approval. And this is this goes back to regulation history, and um, I won't get into that. But this ev eventually NIOSH may incorporate this respirator fit capability standard into our approval process, and ask manufacturers to demonstrate that they meet this requirement prior to submitting an application for approval. And the hope is that by using this standard that we will have better fitting respirators out there and respirators that are able to fit a larger part of the population. Great. Over. And, and you mentioned um, both in your presentation and in your response just now the testing. Um, and we got a very straightforward question on fit testing is how can we fit test disposable masks? And I'm assuming they mean filtering face piece respirators that are single use. So how can you fit test them? Well, the is, so, um, so right now um, there are a couple ways that those respirators are being fit tested. Um, they are, of course, quantitatively use the port account, which results in the, it's a destructive method. And they also are using, um, you know, qualitative methods as well. So um, there are qualitative methods that can be used. Great. All of those, we have a good blog out there about that that we published in, I think, around May time frame with, um, with ways to mass fit test um, individuals qualitatively. Oh, great. Um, so that blog, maybe if Jessica can find it and post it in the chat for everyone, reminds me that um, as you were talking about the new study that's come out that you just published on the use um, on N95s with exhalation valves as source control, that link was also posted in the chat so people can really see what your team studied and, and what you found with the really important study. There's a series of questions both that were asked prior to the webinar and during the webinar that all relate to availability of respirators and availability of N95s. Um, and I've been hearing a lot of different things that some contractors are unable to secure them. I've heard also that there are manufacturers who don't have quite the supply chain set up yet um, so is there anything you can tell us about the availability of N95s um, as you know it right now? Yeah, sure. So what we're finding and hearing is that those respirators that are being used in healthcare most widely by the largest manufacturers are the ones that are difficult to find at this point in time. So. Um, so that is a fact that that it's difficult for any industry apart from healthcare to get those respirators by um, 3M Honeywell, that because the, most of the, their allocation is going to healthcare. However, we have approved um, a lot of respirators from new manufacturers in the country throughout the response, and many of those manufacturers are telling us that they have availability. Um, so I did provide the list of some of those to Scott, and um, that list can be shared. And this, of course, is a dynamic list. I started calling people about a month ago to, to see where they are, and um, there are comments in red um, that describe what the manufacturers say their availability is. And then there's a, you know, there are some manufacturers who've been around a while who also say they have a lot of availability. Um, some are just providing them to states, so um, states and federal and local governments. That's one particular manufacturer called Guangzhou Harley, who is, um, they're out of China, but they are a NIOS approval holder. They have um, set up an organization in Indiana who is their, their distributor in the US. So if you're buying any respirators with that name on it, if it's not coming from that location in Indiana, it's probably counterfeit. Unfortunately, we found counterfeit products from that, um, bearing that name. 
Um, so yes, so there are products out there. The challenge that we have now is that, you know, we still, when it comes to COVID, we still have the current CDC guidance that's for healthcare workers who have close and sustained contact with patients who have confirmed or suspected COVID um, wearing respirators. And then even others in healthcare settings um, who do not have that close and sustained contact with those who have confirmed or suspected COVID are, are, can wear surgical masks. So it's difficult now for us to change any guidance to say that some of these other industries like construction and um, flight attendants and meat processing and wildland fire community and that medium risk category of the ocean pyramid, it's difficult for us to say that, you know, ascertain who's at the greatest risk and changing and how and when we should change that guidance. So that's the complexity we have now when it comes to COVID and, and saying that um, these respirators can be uh, provided to other industry sectors. Right. So um, I'll just put a comment on there. CPWR has long held that um, respirators should be used by construction workers who have no choice but to work in proximity within that kind of magical six-foot barrier is, is, is where we um, had recommended folks from the beginning um, to use respiratory protection. I think that the the av availability of valved masks is something that should be considered in our industry, um, mm -hmm. but also we're, we're starting to see it more out there since, again, this has been recognized as essentially airborne, um, not just droplet spread mm -hmm. by the by parts of the federal government. So the recommendation is out there from a lot of folks that respirators should be used for workers in proximity. Um, and also, um, Cal OSHA has recently put, to, put out an emergency temporary standard that talks about um, the use of respirators for workers in proximity, including in construction. Um, mm -hmm. So I just don't know if you wanted to react to that in any way. Um, I know that you can't say something that's contradictory to CDC guidance, and it takes a mountain to move CDC. But I don't know if you have any, you know, views on on any further any further views on that issue. Yeah, I think the only thing I can say is is what I just said that you know we're looking at this now, and all of those industries in that medium risk band who where we consider construction and meat processing and, and such, so, and, and we're trying to uh, determine what type of recommendation we bring forward um, for these other industries. And right now, the CDC guidance, as, as I mentioned, is just, and as everyone knows, it's just for those healthcare workers who have that close and sustained contact. So what we think would happen if CDC goes beyond that guidance, the next group of workers who are, would be recommended for respiratory protection would probably be the other healthcare workers who aren't wearing, that, wearing them. So um, that's all I could say about that right now. I'd say, you know, you have to, I mean, a lot of unions out there have the recommendations that you have as well, and I completely understand that. And given the unknowns of the situation, I I can understand and respect uh, why you're doing that. Thank you. Um, you had talked about some um, disinfection procedures that were, I think, authorized for for mask for N95 disinfection um, under kind of this emergency crisis mode. Um, well. That's a separate process than this question, which is basically, can can an N95 be washed and reused? Oh no, we wouldn't. Uh, no, no, they, they are disposable devices, so um, they they shouldn't be. Um, right now, there are a few manufacturers like 3M for sure, but of course, you probably can't get 3M products, so that's a comp complexity. Um, but 3M does have disinfection methods that are authorized for use with their FFRs on their website. Um, they, to my knowledge, are the only manufacturer who actually has validated which methods are in, that are in FDA emergency use authorizations can actually be used with their products. We have, um, 
contended throughout the response that that um, before disinfecting or decontaminating any uh, filtering face piece respirator that you should check with the manufacturer because all of these products are comprised of different materials. But you can also look on our website, we have, I didn't mention this, but what we have done is throughout the response, we have evaluated a number of, of respirators using different decontamination methods or disinfection methods to see how that product continues to perform, whether or not the straps are compromised or the nose bridge or the filtration media. And all of those reports are on our website. So they should be under something like, um, if you just would Google like NIOSH respirator assessments, we have three types of assessments out there. We have, um, we have the international respirator assessments, the decontaminated respirator assessments, and the stockpiled respirator assessments. Okay, thank you. Um, but the one, uh, if I could, if I could mention one other thing, there is, there should be a report um, coming out soon on methylene blue, which is another decontamination method for filtering face piece respirators that. Um, was recently evaluated, and we have a report on that on our website as well. And um, that is something in, that is to be used in low resource environments when you don't have, you know, a lot of respirators available and need to don't have a choice but to decontaminate. But that's a new method that ha that is not in the CDC guidance right now. But it's um, something will be coming out soon about that. Great. Um, this is an interesting question. The question is, is there evidence that surgical masks worn over N95s can affect the seal of the N95? And do, does NIOSH have any recommendations regarding this practice? Yeah, so we are aware that some um, people are doing that to preserve the N95. We don't have a lot of evidence that um, that it does indeed preserve it. Um, we find some people saying that it makes um, them sweat more and and have more moisture buildup. But what when people are doing it, um, what um, we say they should do if they're if they are going to do it is use a surgical mask that has ties, not one that has that's going to um, compromise the seal of the face piece. So if you use one with ear loops. It's possible that the way it would cover it would it result in um, it maybe a little bit um, result in moving the the face piece around and, and compromise the seal. But with the ties, you're able to make it uh, tie it a little bit more loosely, so it doesn't impact that seal. Great. You know, there's a series of questions on um, that have come in during the discussion on KN95s. Um, so some some are you know, how is OSHA looking at it? And OSHA has put out some information on, on how they're looking at KN95s. But um, the one question I thought I would ask you is that says, you discussed the filtration capacity of some of the respirators, KN95s question mark, that are evaluated for FDA approval and made in other countries that did not meet the 95%. Can you discuss the seal effectiveness of these respirators in addition to filtration? So it's, again, each of these respirators would have to be fit tested to determine if they would fit a person wearing it. What we have um, heard, and we have not validated this, we have not conducted fit testing on uh, the KN95s, but what we've heard from healthcare organizations who are using these is that these products are a lot wider and um, they're fit. Um, they're made for the Asian population, which has a wider, um, a much wider face than the typical American population. And as a result, it's difficult to fit those smaller face sizes. So that's what we're hearing, but we have not conducted any fit testing ourselves on those devices. Great. Um, and I think this question um, that I'm looking at refers to the NIOSH approved now, the new elastomeric face piece respirator with no exhalation valve. Um, are they available now, or do we know when they will be widely available? 
Yes, I believe the manufacturer is taking um, orders for those. So, um, yes, they are available. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that, I was going to um, go ahead and wrap up the Q&A. Um, most of the other questions you actually answered during your presentation or, again, in the questions and answers, and a lot of them deal with how OSHA views things. So I don't want to um, ask you those questions <laughs> again. Hmm. Um, but I did want to offer if we are able to send out the manufacturers that you mentioned, um, the document where you have compiled manufacturers who have N95s available now um, mm -hmm. as a follow as part of our follow-up email because we will be sending out a link to this recording and to the a PDF of the slides as well as documents that have been mentioned in, in your presentation and in your Q&A as a follow-up. So if possible, I'd like to um, send out the list of manufacturers because I hear it from everybody we can't get them and I know that you you know they're available and so we need to share that information as widely as we can and we'll do that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sure. With that, with that um, Scott, I don't know if you had any closing comments but if not we can go ahead and wrap up today's webinar. I just want to thank you, Dr. De La Alejandro. Um, I Very was really looking forward to this, and um, it's just been an incredible webinar, and you've shared some great information. I appreciate it very much. Um, great. Very much glad to be helpful. You are. And we'll, we'll be um, back on this webinar series after the new year with new topics. So thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Have a good holiday.